Okay. Um, thank you very much for gathering here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about, not just about our supercomputer, but our eventual convergence of the HPC, or supercomputing infrastructure, with uh, big data. So that's what we're working heavily on in our next machine. I'm going to talk a little bit about how GPUs may also play a major role in, in the realm of this convergence of HPC and big data. So that'll be my topic today. Um, so just to give you a very short review of our machine, now Tsubame 2 was the first uh, supercomputer in Japan to surpass one petaflop. You may have heard the same quote uh, at the, you know, today's, uh, this morning's uh, opening. Uh, uh, there, what was instrumental in the performance was, of course, NVIDIA's GPU. And we work with, for, we've been working with NVIDIA for a long time on the GPU technology and how we would master it for its use in uh, HPC setting. So, and recently, uh, about last year, same time last year, we upgraded uh, our old GPU uh, into the new Kepler GPU with the help of both NVIDIA and HP and also with NEC. And that really um, allowed us to not only to get good performance on something like the top 500, but also we got tremendous boost in our real application. This is our Gordon Bell prize winning application 2011, metallic dendritic crystallization, really important for um, building metal, metal alloys. But you see here that Tsubame 2, which got two petaflops and winning the Gordon Bell, but the 2.5, we were getting 3.4 petaflops. So about 70% boost in the performance and other applications, in fact, we've seen factor three increase in performance. So overall, we um, were very happy because we got very good performance boost uh, across the board in many of our GPU intensive applications from material science, life, uh, pharmaceuticals, and, and so forth. We also saw about year round, so it's been about a year since we've been operating under the new GPU setting. So we got about 18% energy reduction. Um, and with the electricity prices in Japan going up because of the Fukushima accident and we're turning off a nuclear reactor, it was really important that we, you know, we save power. And there are lots of things kept being sent here. I don't have time today, but we were able to get um, almost 20% savings in energy by switching to a new GPU. We also able to get um, number one on the green pie in our test machine. So if you look at that's Tsubame 2, when an upgrade to Tsubame 2.5, and something like a K computer, which is a data, uh, very, you know, you would think it's custom built. You might think it has all the latest technology. Well, if you look, the performance is not all that different. In single precision, 17 petaflops. In double, it's 5.7. K computer is about 11. Well, uh, of course, in many applications, K is slightly faster because it has, for example, more memory. But when you, when you look at the cost, it's about 45 million, including power, and that upgrade over six years of operation because we extended a life because of the upgrade versus about, about 1.4 billion for the K. So this is about the 30 time difference. So a lot of people ask me why, what's this factor 30 thing? Why do we get this fantastic value for money? Are we like, you know, are we getting a tremendous discount from NVIDIA people don't know about? You know, something like that. Well, actually, well, we do get discount because we're a large customer, but not this level. So uh, I think the real question is the technology used. So when you look at, compare the technologies that are used in Tsubame, like silicon photonics or many core, uh, multi-core hybrid, lots of, you know, number of threads in the system, or thing like SSD flash that allows us to not only accelerate I.O., but also reduce the cost of not having all the I.O. servers. And the ability to do system active power cap. These are, although Tsumami have been built out of commodity technologies, these are the top of the line technologies of the time, of circa 2013. Whereas machines like Lusion Q or K they had to be planned for a long time because, because they're so custom built. Once they determine the architecture, they have to build something with a technology five years old. Okay. So this is, so we can plan our machine. And I think that was also with Buddy Brandt talk a few minutes ago. 
that we can plan our technology to be landing just right there. Okay, all the new technology elements landing just right there when we deploy the machine versus these where they have to take a very conservative ap approach and machine, um, machine design and manufacturing. So the GPUs play a big role, again, here by being able to deploy the latest the state-of-the-art GPU with the latest processes. So with Subami 3, with that, with all the successes, we a lot of stuff um, to design a next generation machine. Now, now of course, a um, uh, machine like Summit, they said they'll have something in 2017, 18. They announced it now. Unfortunately, according to our rules, we don't have that kind of lead time luxury. So this is a machine that will be built in 2016. Uh, but it'll be quite powerful. Uh, it'll have 20 pedal flops, probably. Uh, lots of memory bandwidth, very high power efficiency, about factor 10 improvement over Tsubame 2. Uh, well, very high bandwidth network, uh, maybe about a petabit of bisection. Um, bigger capacity than the global internet. And very, uh, and very deep memory hierarchy. Now the last part's important because Tsubame 3, Tsubame 2 already had for the, uh, it was the first machine, probably the first large supercomputer to de deploy SSDs on all its nodes. And now everybody's following that. We're planning to have even more aggressive strategy in populating the machine with deeper memory hierarchy, more MVM, to accommodate the next generation scientific big data. And that'll be the big focus of the machine along with others. It's not that we will build a machine that's compromised our performance and HPC to achieve this. It's just that we want, or it's a new direction. And we believe that this convergence of HPC and IDC in big data is in inevitable. And that supercomputers must take the lead. So we're doing all these research, how, you know, all this, all the research. Uh, there are lots of papers we have published over the years, which will make it in, some of which will make it into SC. And uh, like I said, one of the focus is the green. But again, what we want to talk about, you know, is big data. So there are lots of big data. You know, big data is a big buzzword. But most of the time, big data is just used to mean. It's a, you know, just a buzzword, just replacing the words like statistics to big data or, or statistical analysis to big data. So the data you see in the, like, these commercial workloads could be a few, like, you know, fitness SD card. But things are changing. In these scientific workloads, you're getting, A, petabytes and eventually zettabytes of data. Uh, well, exabytes, zettabytes of data. And also the complexity and the required analysis on these data that are far more complex than the simple techniques that are used, being used today. Much deeper, like deep learning, uh, so mu much more deeper analysis using techniques like deep learning, very complex, high order correlative analysis. These will entail, and these are being led by si mostly by science, there are some commercial workloads too that are also getting petabytes of data. Entail petabytes to zettabytes of data, ultra high bandwidth, and they'll be highly unstructured, complex correlation. And this will require, these will require machines to have ultimate capacity and both bandwidth and compute. But what are the machines that have these capabilities? Are they clouds? Probably no. There are supercomputers. Supercomputers by nature have massive bandwidth and have massive compute capability. So why not use supercomputers for big data? Why not? Okay. If you look at, as, a, as one example, it was an anecdote. So um, there's a benchmark graph 500, which is a, supposed to be a big data benchmark. And when this was invented, one of our good friends, Rich Murphy, who's now with Micron, the booth, booth just right there. He had an interview with HPC Wire that said, the cloud architectures may 
come to the higher ranks of the top five of the Graph 500. Graph 500 basically it simulates, uh, well, it does breadth first, breadth first search on what's called a Kronika graph, which is kind of a uh, modeling of um, uh, uh, graphs you see in social networks, similarity graphs. Reality is you see no cloud infrastructure at all on the Graph 500. The machines you see at the top are like K and Sequoia, the same machines as you see on the top 500. So why is that? Well, for example, if you look at you know, Tsumami 2, with advanced silicon photonics, even back in 2020, 2010, we're achieving injection bandwidth of over uh, nearly 100 gigabits per second. And because we have a full bisection network, this is over 220 terabits per second. Whereas the standard IC, of course, this is kind of changing in some of the, you know, like, face, like Facebook and uh, Google, they realize the same phenomena. But a standard IDC, because they use consolidated top of rack switches, they just have one gigabit, in, one gigabit injection, TRR with consolidation, their bandwidth is just meager. So there's a factor of a thousand difference between a large data center and a supercomputer. Moreover, 200 terabits, like I said, means it's the entire global internet average bandwidth. And this is according to Cisco. So a Tsubame only occupies 200 square meters. It's like your whole American house, a floor space in a standard American house. Of course, you have to be able to afford the electricity, so you know, don't try to put a Tsubame in your living room. But, but still, a, small, a machine as small as 200 square meters or 2,000 square feet has the bandwidth to accommodate the entire internet, global internet. And it's quite staggering. So that's why we're embarked on this project, Extreme Big Data, with the question, how do we converge the infrastructure? There are some things on supercomputers that are not amenable to big data, so we need to fix that. There are a lot of things wrong with IDC. We need to fix that. And working with various next generation co-design code applications of big data, we're, try we're trying to see, answer the question, Given a top-class supercomputer, how fast we can accelerate the next generation big data compared to what you see in clouds. And th there are lots of technical questions regarding the architectural issues, algorithmic issues, system of software, uh, and how that's supposed to evolve. Not just looking at the software st HPC software stacks or cloud software stacks today, but how do we converge the software stack? How do we do deal with the algorithm? What are the new algorithms? And of course, for the virtue of NVIDIA, how do we use the GPUs in this, arc, in this whole overall architecture? So obviously, we're going to have a very deep memory hierarchy. We, we need to increase the parallelism because we're dealing with data, and data is big. So we need to have parallelism heterogeneity in order to deal with the complex data. But this is kind of natural. This is what you already see and heterogeneous architectures involving CPUs and GPUs today. What's also, what's cha what the challenge is you also see very, very deep memory a hierarchy. And we, also, we already see that with GPUs of today, but we're talking about not just CPU memory and GPU memory, but we're talking about use of um, uh, uh, you know, memory hierarchy going all the way down to storage. And moreover, in order to basically obtain the necessary capacity, it's very likely we will have to be using next generation memory technologies like MV, uh, various MVN technologies, uh, storage class memories, but also next generation general purpose memories like RERAM and SCT, MRAM and so forth. So we're trying to, what we're trying to do is to define set of programming layer. Some of those are, that are familiar, like MapReduce or like PGAS or SQL, but accelerated on, H, on supercomputers to accommodate, again, to accommodate petabytes of data 
in a very, very optimal fashion. So they may give you the same attractions or some, but we're internally, we're trying to accelerate those. In order to do that, we need to build abstract data models and also associated algorithmic kernels, again, adapting to or making use of these, for example, very high, fast interconnects or massive capacity, but slightly different characteristics, access characteristics, because they're using non-volatile memory. And then, of course, we'll have to look at the hardware architect architectures, like how do we um, how do we accommodate the lower-level tiers of the system software, like or the hardware architecture, like the file systems, uh, data objects. How do we utilize burst buffer? What are the appropriate networking technology? And of course, there's all the uh, hardware layers underneath. How do we design a machine with appropriate extreme big data architecture? So working this on us very heavily, one, and there are lots of papers we are publishing. I'll just give you uh, one or two samples. One sample is, uh, so we've been working a lot on the graph algorithm. And like I said, and trying to compete with IBM. Um, last time, uh, we, we were number one. Um, and well, you know, we were finally able to uh, beat IBM in, in this endeavor. So we got you know, massive, um, we got very fast. Uh, you know, we got very high score on solving the breadth search problem on a very large graph that's f basically filling up almost the entire K's memory, K computer's memory. Yeah, this is like 1.6 petabytes. When we do the analysis of the algorithm, we find, find that for smaller problems, the compute uh, well, dominates, well, not entirely dominate, but compute is a major fraction compared to the network. But for this, uh, what's called a scale 40, a scale 40 problem using 65,000 nodes of K or about 400,000 cores, we find that the runtime per, uh, actually the performance per node is substantially decreased because about 73% of the time is being spent on the network, on communication, because we have larger graph. So there are, we're doing some work to try to reduce this. You know, it's more algorithmic um, improvements to reduce this. But this also goes to show you know, the K computer has one of the fastest networks in the world. However, even with that, we're still hit with the fact that two thirds, uh, well, almost three quarters of the time is being spent on communication. And how can we do that with a cloud infrastructure with one gigabit ethernet and top of rack switches? It's just impossible, okay? We're doing lots of other things like how do we use GPUs and MapReduce? How do we, and also deal with a very, very deep memory hierarchy? So uh, we're defined, we'll have a MapReduce interface, but with all the accommodations of GPUs, CPUs, and a memory hierarchy. And we're finding that with that, uh, with under very heavy workloads, we do get um, a si um, reasonable acceleration by using GPUs. Although not stellar, we do get accelerations over uh, pure CPU environment. Similarly, on large scale sort, and sorting is very important for various big data app, uh, applications, including th doing things like even building doing, uh, large scale SQL queries over petabytes of a data set. We're finding, and this has been really recently published in IEEE Big Data, we're finding that we do, again, get significant speed up over CPUs because we use GPUs to do the sorting and GPUs higher bandwidth, although not as much as we would like. So we did the analysis, why, where are we getting the overhead? And we're finding actually that much of the overhead comes because of the PCI bottleneck. So PCI is hampering the results. So we modeled the performance and, and did an, an, a speculative analysis of what if the next generation PCI or technologies like uh, um, MB-Link will give us much faster interconnect between the CPUs and GPUs. And we find that 
uh, with when the GPU is no longer bottleneck, which is like 50 to 100 gigabytes per second, which is what you know, next generation NV Link will present us, our bottleneck goes away. The bottleneck shifts to other parts of the machine. And there we get substantial speed up. And by the way, the sort rate we're getting here is about 10 to 50 times faster than what Google does in their Google sort. Okay. So again, the using future supercomputers is important, but we also need to identify the bottlenecks for our big data. And there are lots of other stuff, but I think I skip in the interest of time, but we're doing more uh, like things like uh, parallel sorting out from variable length keys, again on GPUs and also in Xeon 5s. So we'll get very interesting results there. We'll also look at the graph algorithms in terms of using a non volatile memory. And we're, we, have, so we have algorithms where uh, we can expand our, the size of the graph well beyond our DRAM. So like most of the 75% of the graph resides in the flash memory, but we only suffer 7% um, performance decrease because of our optimized algorithm. And let's skip all this. I'm sorry. So where do we go from here? So in the future, we believe it's not just to build a machine that's big or just have GPUs in them. It's to really think of how we can revolutionize the IDC and HPC conversions about building more innovative machines. So our, this is our Tsubama KFC right now, which is currently the greenest. We made you know, greenest machine in the world. But we believe that we can fit something like a K computer, which is pretty amenable for large scale, graph, uh, large scale big data processing, just into a single box. This means putting about 10,000 nodes of K which is, occupies about 30,000 square feet into a single rack. And with more memory, with the use of non volatile memory. And the K is like a big data center. K, you know, any data center with nearly 100,000 nodes is a big data center. But we believe we can put the entire thing in a single box. And we can do it with judicious use of 3D stacking, optical interconnects, and high density packaging. And, but this is something we're shooting for in a 2020, well, 2022 timeframe. But if you're interested, we have the prototype of a prototype. It's still a conceptual prototype. The Tokyo Take booth is right there. You see uh, booth 1857. You see a dense architecture built with a uh, Tegra K1. Of course, this is just this is not anything useful, but it's just a conceptualization of the densely populated architecture that hopefully in about eight to 10 years will become the mainstream to make the big data centers to basically Jurassic. With 10 times more flops, 10 times more bandwidth, silicon photonics, non-volatile memory, more even higher no design, no density, with uh, liquid cool with uh, immersive cooling, with packaging, all the software stack, we can we believe we can build a data center, entire data center in a single box, and this data center is convergence of HPC and big data, as I have been describing. Okay, so with that, I should end my talk, and thank you for listening. If you're interested, again, please come to our booth and uh, see this in action. Thank you.